All right, so one of the big ideas is that you're in a class about blogging for various reasons. The reason that I'm going to focus on is because blogging is part of the, um, of the art and the science of SEO, search engine optimization. If you, want a partic if you want your presence online to be known, you can't let your website stagnate. You might have built it maybe two months ago, but you maybe don't have traffic for various reasons. You haven't perhaps search engine optimized it. You haven't learned the, tic the tricks and techniques and the tips and the do's and don'ts to get traffic to your website. Because nowadays less people use the phone book. They still publish it, they still drop it on your doorstep, you still put it in the recycle bin, but uh, less people use the phone book. More people use search engines, right? People go to google.com, yahoo.com, bing.com, they, they search. Maybe without even trying, they're searching because the web browser nowadays has built-in search. So we want to get found. You want your website, your online presence to get found. And if you take the SEO class, we go into much more detail. But basically, we have three big ideas. Three big ideas of SEO. Longevity, authority, and content. If your website is out longer than your competitors, you have an edge there. You've got more longevity. Because anyone can make a website. Any fly-by-night organization can make a website, can make 10 websites. And therefore, uh, the longer your website is out there, the better for you. The search engines will see your website's been around for two years, that competitor's been around for two months. So they'll give more precedence more preference um, to your website that's been out longer. But either your website has been out, has been on the website on the web for a year or it has not. There's no way to fake it, there's no way to trick it to backdate your website to five years ago. So if you don't have a website, you have to start thinking about setting up a website simply to build your longevity. I'm not saying go out and rush and buy a website right now. There's still a lot to talk about that. But something to think about is the longevity of your site. How old or young is it? Uh, the older it is, the more it could help your SEO. So the longer time online is better. But that's just one of the signals, one of the many signals that the search engines pay attention to. The other one is authority. So if your uh, if your if your website has perhaps a lot of links pointing to it. If your website is cited on other websites, you have some sense of authority. Your, your website is relevant to people. So authority relates to how relevant is it to your audience. And you build that authority through content. Your updates and blog posts, all of that stuff. That's the content. That's what we're going to be focusing on here. We're going to be writing blog posts. Um, we're going to be writing them out on a regular basis. Hopefully, the longer you have your blog, the better. So we're going to talk about how do you keep it going. You might have a flurry of activity early on, the first month or two or three, but this is a long proposition. SEO takes, takes time. Once you build up a good foundation, you have to keep it going. So uh, for good SEO, you have to think in the long term. Therefore, we'll be brainstorming and talking about long-term um, series of blogs you can write. So we're going to focus on your content. We're then going to be building your authority because you're going to be writing a variety of content that is relevant and interesting and important to your audience. And again, it's your, your blog has either been out a while or it hasn't. So I go into much more detail, of course, in the SEO class, but those are three big ideas, the three pillars in general of, of SEO.
Any questions so far? Yes. That's one of the ways that you get authority, yes, having activity on a forum, and there's many others. Uh, but basically, the more activity you've got on your site, or links to your site, that builds your authority and that helps you. Yes? So is there a way to overcome longevity? Because obviously, you don't have a lot of... Um, you know, don't have a website up, mm -hmm. you want to put one up. Yeah, you counteract the, the problem of longevity with authority and content. content. Okay. Yeah, you focus on those two to uh, help overcome the deficiency in longevity, and then eventually you'll have the longevity, and then all three. Wait, more detailed question than that. Sure. Regarding WordPress in particular, uh -huh. you have a site, but you don't have any of the search engine optimization turned on, uh -huh. but even though you already have the site, uh -huh. it doesn't count until the search engines can find you, or it doesn't count? Eventually, if you never take the time to make yourselves known to the search engines, they will find you eventually. But it could be weeks or months or years. So if you if you focus on activating your SEO features and such, they will find you much faster, and therefore your, your customers could find you much faster. Any other uh, questions up to this point? Yes? Does um, submitting your site map uh, help with yeah, that's a very good, uh, rather advanced point. But yes, if you've got a website or a blog and you've got a site map and you submit it to the search engines, that definitely helps you. Uh, so if you don't know what that means, take the SEO class because we go into more detail. But a site map is basically a listing of all of the pages on your site. But it's not something that you write yourself. It's very technical. So your website should be able to create a site map for you and then you submit it to the search engines. How do you do that? Again, take the SEO class. There's a lot of uh, details, and we can't, we, we, we could, there's be no way to uh, fit it all in two weeks, even on four weeks. That's why it's divided into several classes. So, the concept of blogging, or some of the concepts of blogging, is that it is timely relevant and has authority. There's authority again. So timely. Whatever timetable you want to adhere to is probably better than what you've already got now in that. How many of you have ever blogged before? Raise your hand. Very few people. Okay. If you haven't, that's okay. That's what this class is about. Those of you that did raise your hand, when was the last time you blogged? Was it a month ago or less? Less. Okay, that's very good. Uh, if you didn't say less than a month, then you might have an old blog. Yes, a month could be old. Internet time, after all, moves much faster. So if you set up a website a year ago, and you started to blog a year ago, and you did it for three months, and then you kind of fell off a bit, that's, uh, you know, three quarters of a year that you haven't been active on your site. So the search engines will see that and say, well, why would we rank them higher than this other site that is publishing on a timely, on a regular basis? How regular? Well, as a beginner, to start off, I would say once a month. At least once per month is a good goal to start off. If you've got more experience, that sounds like way too loose of a, of a schedule. But as a beginner, you don't want to burn yourself out yet. Once a month is good. When you're getting more intermediate, well, you're going to be blogging more than once a month. You could be blogging once a week, once per week. And so the websites that get a lot of traffic are the websites that are updated every day. You might not think about them as blogs, but news sites, online magazines, anything that is updated on a regular basis is a form of a blog. And those are updating every day. Those are updating multiple times a day. So advanced once per day. That obviously is a lot of work. Well, we'll be talking about how to handle that as time goes on. But that's a good general rule of thumb as a beginner. Once a month, intermediate, once a week, advanced once a day. 
how much? We'll get to that. Question. I know you mentioned in the SEO class to uh, not post the same uh, article as the on all these different social medias and stuff. Does that hold the same true for blogging, like I put something on Facebook for the office, not necessarily maybe trying to do something different for the blog? Well, that's, matter? it, it matters to some degree, but it also matters what your content is. Uh, so if you're, I would not really use Facebook as a blog. It's, a, it's more of a social network with short amount of content. Really, your blog is where you could write the 500 words, 700 words, 100 words. You're not going to use, you could use Facebook for that, but you're not going to because people absorb that content quickly and move on. If they really care, then they'll click through to your website to read the rest. So what you could do on the social networks is write a snippet of that blog to entice people to click back to your website where you've got the whole 200 words. So duplicate content, to some degree it's okay, like if you're, entice, if you're putting an enticing snippet, but to repost your whole 500 word blog post everywhere, that's not so good. The search engines see that as duplicate content and the search engines don't quite like that. You want different content, timely content. Yes? If you're writing an educational blog, let's say for the first year you update it daily or weekly, at a certain point you already wrote everything for that particular subject, will that knock you down if you don't write at some point? It will, because then you're not timely anymore. You might have been timely a year ago, but then you've dropped off and your content might still have good relevancy and authority, but it's not as timely, and someone else might have written the, the version 2 of that same article, and therefore the search engines see that and maybe don't rank you as highly. So as, when we talk about the brainstorming, we'll see that we can probably still think of a lot of things to write. Because you, you know your content so well, you might be focused on what to write and how to write it, but as we brainstorm, we'll see other people might give us different ideas of what else you could write, and you'll find more sources of what to write. So then we've got relevant. Is your blog relevant? How much relevancy do you have? That is, uh, why... Do your readers care? Why do they care to come back again and again? Why would they come back? If you wrote one amazing blog, blog post of 1,000 words, and you got a bunch of tweets and uh, retweets and Facebook likes and all that, great! What's next? Because, you know, stars fade. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's the nature of things, that you wrote something great, you put out something great, but if that's the only thing you're going to rely on, you're not going to have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, continuing <coughs> fame or activity. So, uh, we'll be talking about, again, in the brainstorming session, uh, what is relevant to your readers what is relevant to your readers and uh, why would they keep reading and coming back and sharing your content so we'll go into more detail about that but think about why would people care to read that and share it as you create more relevant content you are building authority you are um, showing the search engines that you should be ranked higher than your competitors because look at these links to my blog, look at these comments to my blog, look at these shares of my blog. Authority. You're showing the search engines why you matter. To people first and the search engines. The search engines are going to tell you nowadays, create content and optimize for people, not the search engines, not the algorithm, not the technique, because the algorithm could change every once in a while, but people are still going to care or not care about your content. So timely, your, uh, your blogging should be timely, relevant, and have authority. And again, all of those are related. 
to each other. You might have one of more and less of the other. That's okay. But as long as you're addressing all of them and thinking about all of them and trying to improve all of them, it'll work out better for you in the long term with more traffic to your site and whatever it is you're trying to do on your site, more increase of that. Yes? A question about search engines. They're uh, directed or manipulated by humans, right? I mean, as far as ranking, they uh, can sometimes be adjusted? To some degree, but the search engines, especially Google, really wants to find the perfect machine algorithm to take the human folly out of it, which there's something to be said about the human helping to rank these things, but there's just so many billions of websites to rank and deal with that the search engines try to find a, a, a computer algorithm to do it the best. They perhaps haven't gotten to it yet, but that's why they're always tweaking their algorithm, their technique to rank you better. So I would assume more that uh, a computer is making the choice, and maybe the human steps in once in a while to, to improve the choices, but usually it's, it's a computer algorithm making the decisions of the ranking. So if I talk about these things in a, in a very general sense, then you would conclude, or you hopefully should conclude, that then every um, website needs a blog. And it would make sense, like, let's say for a law firm. Off the top of your head, what do you think you would find on a lawyer's blog? Any opinion? Past cases, tips on what? Sure. Anything How else? New law. How to deal with the new laws? Areas of specialty in the law. And specialty. Okay, so there's various um, ideas that people have about what they might find on a lawyer's blog. And you might not have had one of those ideas. There's already four ideas there of what people would be looking for on a lawyer's blog. And there's a variety of types of lawyers, of course, family law and uh, estate law and all of that. So all of these could apply to just about any type of, of lawyer. And so um, this is one example where it might be obvious. Yeah, a lawyer should have a blog because they could provide this content to their users. Let me ask you this. Let's say this is a restaurant. A fine dining Italian food restaurant. What would you want to find in their blog? A menu, sure. Maybe deeper than a menu? Well, the regional part. The regional foods, what part of is it southern Italian? Like the story of the region of the food? Well, is, it, is it southern Italian or northern Italian? Definitely. So that's one thing people could be looking for. Any regional food. What yeah. region is this from? Mm -hmm. Special. Specials, like an expose or another word, an expose of the specials of the month. Hours of operation. Not quite. Not really for a blog. That would be just for the home page, so that I know when they're open and when I can go. Um, Where do they source their food? So, info on sourcing their food. So, in, in a sense here, we're kind of seeing a few things about the food, the story behind the food. The background of the chef. So, the story behind the food, behind the chef, behind the employees, there's a variety of things that would be interesting to look at in this blog of this Italian food restaurant, which you might not have thought of. Why would a restaurant need a blog? Well, first of all, we should hopefully have established we want a blog for your business to help your SEO, number one. So if you commit to that, that yes, I agree, a blog is important for a website. Then comes the harder task of, okay, what should my blog be about? And here I have two extremes where perhaps I might, it's more obvious what kind of blog for a lawyer, and then now maybe ideas of what kinds of blog posts for a restaurant. And again, we will, we will take the time to, if you choose, to talk about everyone's idea of what your site is about, or your project, or your goal, and we will figure out some ideas of what to write about. So, in short here, we have no excuse for having a blog 
on our site, the content we, we can write uh, through brainstorming and such. These other aspects, timeliness, you might think, well, I'm going to commit every month. Okay, I'm a beginner, but I'm going to commit once a month to write a blog post. That's a big endeavor. I'm busy running the business, and I've got to write 100 words. Well, we'll talk about how we can automate that. These blogs let you write something like, let's say, 500 words. You write 500 words on a Sunday and then split them into various sized blog posts and have it automatically post for you this month and next month and next month and next month. So you're not tied to the computer every end of the month. You just set it up in one month and it does its thing for five months in a row. And there you have timeliness, half a year of blog posts. Relevant, is it important to your users? We'll be talking about that as well. And as you keep being timely and relevant, that leads to authority and vice versa. So this is basically why we need and want blogging to get traffic. Sometimes people... Storyteller. What's that? So to be a good blogger, you need to be a good storyteller. I think so, because people, some people will want to read the dry technical stuff, but oftentimes people want to read something interesting, and that often has an interesting voice. So if you haven't crafted that, that's okay. It takes practice. Does it matter how many people look at it, or is it just the words in it? Yes, it does matter. The traffic to your site, the popularity to your site, popularity breeds popularity. And that's a whole other can of worms, which I was about to say that sometimes people come in here and they say, well, I'm already doing really well on Facebook or Pinterest. Why do I need a blog? I get pretty good traffic from my, twi from my tweets. Why do I need a blog? Well, the thing is, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, your big conversion goal, what is your main objective of your of your online presence. You're not going to be able to accomplish that goal on a social network. You're going to be able to get followers and likes and retweets and favorites and all of that stuff on a social network. But you can't sell that pasta on Twitter. You can't sell your service as a lawyer on Facebook. You can't sell or have people sign up for your newsletter on Pinterest. You can't have them refer you to a, a friend uh, if they're a past customer. You can't do that ultimate goal on the social networks. You can just advertise. And it is going to change because right now the big players can do those things. You can buy something through a tweet on Amazon. Amazon tweets that there's these speakers on sale and all you have to do is reply with a keyword or something and then you buy it. You can buy stuff through a tweet. You might not have heard about that, but that's, that's being tested and it's out at the moment and it might become more prevalent. So same thing with Pinterest. Pinterest is working to make the ability, you see a cool pin, it's going to be a buy button. Right now the big players can do that perhaps, Amazon and eBay and such, but we're not that big yet. So we don't have that access yet. So still you're going to need to drive traffic back to your site. That's where you're going to complete that goal sell something, a goods or services, sell your ebook, give away your ebook, your music, get people to sign up for your newsletter, get more referrals for your dog walking business, etc. Your website is still your ultimate goal. So all efforts, which will be blogging, social media, SEO, in service of your website traffic because your website uh, your website is where you complete your main goal whatever main goal it is that you have let's say my company PMD interactive we our main goal is to uh, find clients so that we can make them a website well, we're going to be blogging about website-related stuff. We're going to be tweeting about professional businesses and uh, tips for small businesses. We're going to be on Facebook putting out uh, coupons for free consultation or whatever. In, in, in the goal that they come back to our website, click on that, you know, request a free consultation button or request a quote or whatever. We're trying to accomplish that goal on the website that we cannot accomplish on the social networks. And the blog also is part of that goal to help us accomplish it.
Let me show you then in a, a live example. This is a client that we have. You can look at this also if you'd like. This is a client that we've got that um, is, a, is a Mexican food restaurant. Again, you wouldn't think a restaurant might have a blog, but I'll show you a real-world example. So it's a little hard to spell, perhaps. AquiStexCoco.com. They are a restaurant that started in Tijuana. They came to San Diego in 2008. And then they expanded to Los Angeles last year. They've gotten some fame. Um, they've had the Travel Channel do a couple of episodes on them. Uh, Rachel Ray voted their tacos highly. Uh, they've had a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, critic critique them. Um, two uh, cooking shows filmed this year and are coming out during the summer, so they've been doing well. They're a restaurant. So again, at first blush, you might think, well, why, why would a restaurant have a blog? Now, it's Mexican food, but it's not nachos and California burritos and that sort of thing. It's traditional Mexican lamb barbecue. So barbacoa de borrego. It's lamb barbecue, slow roasted lamb barbecue. And the blog is about educating people on the food, on the beverages, on the traditional beverages, on the traditional food, to entice you to order online or book a table. So if you're, if you're on the site and reading the blogs and the reviews and getting hungry, then there's the button right there, order online. So who wants to take out their credit card and we'll order a whole meal for that class? <laughs> is blogging proactive or is it passive or a combination? Do you mean the you voice? push out to a list? It's both because um, you're going to be publishing on your site and people are going to come to it, so in a sense that's passive, but you're still definitely going to include an active aspect in that you also publish your blog or link to your blog on your Twitter and your Facebook and mailing list and all of that. So you do want to do both, but really you want to focus more on the active. Because in the real world, if this restaurant that was just starting off wanted customers, are they going to have a better chance opening the doors and waiting for someone to show up or to put out a radio ad, a TV ad, a newspaper ad, something on Facebook? They're going to get more when they advertise, when they're active. So same thing with your blog. So here's a post here, just uh, sort of congratulatory. These are some celebrities and chefs that have visited, uh, some other ones there. Um, they opened in Commerce, which is just uh, south of Los Angeles, so there's a blog post about that. And then here's one, Pulque, Drink of the Aztec Gods. How many of you have heard of Pulque before? Two people. So if you haven't, three people. So if you haven't, read that. Basically, it's an alcoholic beverage made from the maguey plant. The maguey plant looks a lot like and is related to the agave plant. What does agave graduate into? Tequila. Tequila. So the agave plant is related to it, and it also graduates into an alcoholic beverage. And this uh, restaurant serves that. One of the few restaurants in the region that sells real pulque. You can go to the uh, Mexican uh, groceries and get it in a can, and you know when it's in a can it's pasteurized and all of that. It kind of deadens the flavor. Here it's authentic. One of the very few places that actually serves it authentically. So I didn't know that. I'm interested. I'm thirsty. Order online. Uh, but anyway, you would go to a particular blog post, and the examples of these blog posts that I'm going to be showing you adhere to the various techniques that we're going to talk about. And then the end result, for example, is look at these social shares. The, the blog didn't just live on the site. It also went off to Facebook and Twitter and Google+, etc. So for example, breaking down this blog post a little bit, just about any blog post, and I'll have a handout for you, I have a handout for you, that explains all of these tips and check, checklists and such, but just in general. We have a picture, we have the relevant text, divisions of the sections, we'll go into it in detail of course, but just in general. Again, practicing what I preach. I teach these things in these classes and I do these things, my company does these things for the clients.
Yes. Um, do they write their own blog posts, or do you write them for them? In this particular case, we write for them, but depending on the client, it's either or. Some so clients. I do suggestion their topics, or. Yes, because the uh, the business owner and the people that run the business are busy running the business. They never really had the idea to write. And it's very well-meaning to say, well, you're the owner of the business, you know so much about this, let's write about this. They're busy running the place. So we try to educate ourselves as much as possible and speak with the owners and the employees and everything and learn as much as we can. Obviously coming straight from their mouths would be the best, but perhaps they're not the best writers. They don't have the time. That's why they hire us, because we have the time, we have the professionals and the rest of the company that can do this. Our, of course, um, challenge or speed bump is to know as much about the particular client before we can write something that is relevant to the company. Basically, you let the professionals do what they know how to do. So there's one here about craft beer. So again, there's text, there's pictures, there's links, headings, things that will go to in detail. Social activity, related content. Maybe someone came to this blog post through Twitter and they liked it, and then they get to the end and there's other interesting ones to read. Oh, I didn't know they were open in LA. So then they read that. So related posts. Yes. Two locations. Yes, two locations. They just opened in Los Angeles and they've been in Chula Vista and they started in Tijuana. Then there's the ability for people to leave replies, comments and such. We'll get into the pros and cons of that a little later. Yes. There was there was a website and there was social media and there was a blog before it. So while we can't track exactly if one led to the other, unless we ask everyone at Food Network, did our blog change your mind? Uh, it all relates in the total of the food itself, the presence online, the presence offline, the blogging, so everything uh, that led to, to everything, the connections with people and everything. So it's known as Honeywood. One version of it, yes. Um, fascinating thing which just reminded me, does anyone know the old name for the avocado? Everyone thinks it's the avocado, but when it was first coming to California, the U.S., alligator the alligator pear. It looks like a pear. It looks like an alligator. But now we know them as avocados. So that could be something interesting to write about here, because obviously avocados are served with, the, with these meals here, and that might be something interesting to write about. Again, if we're focused on only talking about the dishes, Sure, we have content to write about, but other related tangential things could be interesting to write about and could cause uh, comments, social shares, etc. Let's look at another example. Um, let's go to brand. It's spelled. It's pronounced brand graphics, but it's spelled brandgfx.com brand graphics slash blog. One tip is, this is the standard web address. It's your website slash blog. It's pretty standard. If yours is something else, it could still work, but oftentimes this is where people search uh, first, or the search engines. So if you have something else like blog.brandgraphics.com. It works like a regular blog, but it's not quite as um, properly set up as this method. The name of your website slash blog. And there's plenty of other ways to do it. Of course, it could be brandgraphics.com slash the blog. That could work also. It's a fully functional blog. But again, 
it's becoming pretty much the standard to have that kind of template for your website and your blog. Maybe you have something that's brandgraphics.wordpress.com. Again, that's fine, but this has a variety of issues, negative issues, which I'll talk about later. If you've got a WordPress blog, great. But if you've got your WordPress blog on WordPress.com, that's not so great. I'll talk about the differences a little bit later. But here I'm just showing uh, the original domain here, blog. And so let's say we went just to this screen. We never went to the home page. Based on some of these headlines of the blogs and the content, and if you go to next page, what would you say perhaps this website is about, or what do they sell, or what's their product? What would you say? Let's see, there's an article about marketing. spam marketing, the art of asking testimonials and referrals, marketing, top 10 lists receive higher engagement than other blog posts. So marketing is what I'm going for, but other you might have also said just web design or graphic design and such, and that would all be true. But this site, notice this blog is mixed up a little bit in that there are some blog posts that are longer form, meaning they've got a headline, they've got a little teaser, and then read more. There's some blog posts that are just a quick tip like that. Um, so there's different ways we could we could blog, different um, styles or, or designs. But let's say I wanted to look at um, the art of asking for testimonials and referral referrals. If if you don't ask for any, you likely won't get them. If you ask the wrong way, you'll likely damage your client relations and possibly even your brand. So this is basically about uh, Yelp and uh, all those review sites. Yelp and what are some other ones? TripAdvisor and Angie's List and Kudzu. All of these review websites. Uh, you're going to get reviews. You're either going to get two kinds of reviews. The, the ones that love you or the ones that hate you. The ones in the middle kind of don't care. But the ones that love you or hate you are the more important ones. Because if someone has a bad experience in your restaurant, they're going to remember that all the way home to create a brand new Yelp account to trash you. The ones that had a great experience, most likely then will also at some point take the time to give you a good review. The people in the middle that liked it but didn't hate it, that were okay, they're going to forget and move on and never give you a positive or negative. So this blog post is about, well, what's the art and the science? The art of it, of asking for that. So this blog post, again, adheres to many of these concepts that we'll be talking about in the class, like lists. This is all in the handout that I'm giving you. I'm just mentioning them briefly, but lists are a way to divide up blog posts because they allow you to skim the content and then focusing focus in on the thing that is most interesting to you. Nowadays people unfortunately don't read like they used to. They don't read the whole 200 words, 500 words. They skim until they find something that interests them, then they stop and read that chunk, maybe read another chunk, maybe skip until they find something else. So you probably do that, maybe consciously or subconsciously. Maybe you're doing it right now. You're looking at this and skipping and then you see something. Make it easy for your customers. I want to read that. I see something bold that stands out. That catches my eye. I want to read that. Again, we'll talk about the tips and tricks and techniques in more detail. But I'm just showing examples here of some good blogs you might, from clients, that you might be interested in, in looking at as examples. The ability to share on social media. If you've got a blog and you've had it out there for a while, but you don't have an easy way for people to share on social media, that's something you need to look at. I like this enough, I want my friends on Facebook to know. I want my colleagues on LinkedIn to know. I want to email it to someone. If you don't have a way to share easily, you're doing yourself a disservice. Let's look at another one. So that was a marketing company with a blog. Here's another one. 
ElsaValencia.com. This is an up-and-coming jeweler. She makes her own 10 karat jewelry. Um, and so, for sale, right? Uh, she sells throughout the U.S. And uh, she's got a blog in here also. And the thing about her blog is that she uses it to really craft the story behind her craft. Uh, she writes about how she built something and her techniques and the story behind the pieces. It's going to come up in a moment. And it's also a very graphic, heavy blog because you want to see these things. You want to see what are you getting for those $1,600. You're getting this story. You're getting this craftsmanship, this elegance, this style. And that's being explained on the blog to help sell it. For some reason, it's a bit slow. But when that comes up, you can look at it. What makes some websites take longer to come up than others? There's so many factors that could slow down a website. It could be how many pictures you've got, how much text, do you have animation and video, do you have a lot of links. It might even be as basic as, well, the server or the, or the website where you bought your site is slow. You know, if you've got a larger domain name, a more well-known one, it might be faster than the mom-and-pop ones that are in the area. So lots of factors, unfortunately. Okay, so here's the blog. Um, this was posted July 10th, so less than a month ago, pretty current. Great pictures to catch your attention. I'm interested in that. Read more. I don't have the whole, the whole blog post thrown on the blog page. I have a teaser of it and read more. If people are interested, then they will read more. If you've got the whole blog post, then that's a, a way that it could slow down your site. And then I could look at older posts and so forth. Pinterest is very important in this in this niche of jewelry, and she uses Pinterest very well, and Instagram, those very s visual social networks. So I can quickly pin it. I've got Pinterest open all day long, I pin it, and I share that with my friends. But what's the point of getting any shares on Twitter and Facebook and likes and all of that? What's the point of that? That's a form of advertising, of marketing, getting free advertising and marketing and getting free cheerleaders from your visitors. So I click read more and then I have many more pictures to look at, more text to read to entice me. All, all of this is about uh, it's it's a form of marketing and advertising and all advertising and marketing is trying to convince you of something if you're hungry and you see a billboard for that steak it might convince you to go get that steak if uh, you don't smell so good today and you see that commercial for that deodorant you might get convinced to get that deodorant if um, you know, your, your dog is getting chubby and you need a dog walker because you can't do it, you might see an ad for that dog walker and you get that dog walker. So here you see all of these great photos of elegance and sophistication and style and uniqueness in the jewelry. I'm, I'm elegant and unique and sophisticated. I want that. And then there's the shop. So we can see many more examples. Those are three examples so far of websites that my company is involved with. So those are those hands-on examples. You can go in and see the various details of them um, I'll show you one more thing and then we'll uh, we'll take a break. Uh, this is not anyone that I'm affiliated with or my company. This is just a good website that I recommend for you. It's called mashable.com. M-A-S-H-A-B-L-E, Mashable.com. This is a blog, this is a website that is updated every day, like almost every hour or, or so, about a variety of topics, about online culture, 
technology, social media, blogging, they have lots of tips, how-to's, variety of topics. It's updated all the time. You can focus on the section at the top left. You have this little menu. Click on that and say, show me the, the stuff about social media. So you'll find plenty of articles there to, to teach you about many important things about social media and blogging and all of that. So you, I recommend Mashable.com. Open up the menu there, top left. Go to social media and, and see what they've got. Yes? So this particular example, the blog is the actual business, right? As opposed to a restaurant that's using a blog to get customers to the physical location? Well, um, yes and no, but a lot of what, for better or for worse, a lot of what a business of a, of a website nowadays is, is, a, is an advertising platform. Mashable writes great content, but they don't pay their employees by the number of times you click on a post. They pay by the amount of money they get from their sponsors. Many websites are like that, that as the sponsors get clicks, then the site gets money, and then they pay their content creators. So in a sense, these people that write for Mashable, of course, want to put out the best content, but you don't get paid by that. Wait. It's like a news media that, that uh, posts advertising. Exactly. Or good old television. Television is free. All you need is an antenna. You can watch free TV. All you have to do is watch through, suffer through the commercials. So even if you never buy anything on those commercials, that's how you're getting that free TV. So these blogs and such are free, but there's enough people that are clicking on the ads that are relevant that then the companies themselves get... Uh, some revenue. So let's uh, take a short break and then we'll, uh, when we come back, we'll get more hands on. It's uh, 7.18. We'll take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 7.28 and we'll go on.